Welcome to NTD News. I'm Kevin Hogan. Let's take a look at today's top stories. President Biden kicking off his first overseas trip as president. What are the main topics for discussion at the G7 summit? And what challenges does NATO face? Meatpacker JBS says it paid hackers $11 million after the ransomware attack. The hack disrupted operations. The company CEO explains why he chose to pay. The company behind the Keystone Pipeline abandons the project after Biden's executive order halting it. But what will the company in Alberta province do following the project's termination? Ohio's attorney general files a lawsuit against Google. He says the company is acting in a discriminatory way and calls for it to be categorized as a public utility. Get the COVID-19 vaccine in Washington state and you could get a free joint. This latest vaccine incentive named Joints for Jabs is raising some eyebrows and adds to a growing list of incentives as vaccine rates continue to fall. President Biden's in England today meeting with the Prime Minister on his first overseas trip as president. Tomorrow the G7 summit begins with some main topics for discussion including Russia, China and the origin of the CCP virus. NTD's Jessica Beatty has the details. President Biden begins his first overseas trip as president, landing in England Wednesday. Biden gave his first speech at a British airbase northeast of London. This is my first overseas trip as president of the United States. I'm heading to the G7, then to the NATO ministerial, and then to meet with Mr. Putin to let him know what I want him to know. He has a full schedule, with the G7 summit taking up the most time. One topic up for discussion is the origin of the CCP virus. The European Commission president is calling for a real investigation. We have to know where it did come from to make sure that this will never happen again. And therefore, the investigators need complete access to whatever is necessary to really uh, find the source of this pandemic. Other main topics at the G7 summit will be China and Russia. Biden says the U.S. will take action if Russia engages in harmful activities. I'm going to communicate that there are consequences for violating, for violating the sovereignty of democracies in the United States, in Europe, and elsewhere. Mr. Vladimir Putin, Mr. Tensions President. are high between the U.S. and Russia following two high-profile cyber attacks. It's believed the hackers were based out of Russia, although the Russian government hasn't been linked to the attacks. Biden says NATO needs to modernize for cyber threats. Another question facing NATO is whether to let Ukraine join. One prerequisite is to resolve international disputes. But Ukraine has been in conflict with Russia since 2014, which suggests it won't happen anytime soon. Ukraine's leader spoke with Biden by phone earlier this week. Biden will attend the NATO summit Monday and end his trip with Russian President Vladimir Putin. Jessica Beatty, NTD News. The English region of Cornwall is preparing to host the G7 summit. But locals there are less than thrilled about the impact of the world's leaders' presence on their daily lives. NTD's Andrew Thomas reports. Cornwall will serve as home base the next few days for many of the world's leaders. They're meeting ahead of the G7 summit. But residents in the coastal town of St. Ives voiced concern on Wednesday about the impact the gathering is having on their lives and businesses. Megan Steeds owns St. Ives Boat Rides. She says the financial impact on her business will be substantial as customers cancel bookings. Normally at this time of year we would be absolutely packed and we'd be fully booked all day long um, and it's just not happened. It's, you know, people have just been ringing up, cancelling left, right and centre. Um, so yes, yeah, it's, it's been completely detrimental to our business. Visitors have been told to expect disruptions or avoid the area over the next week starving the tourist town of much needed foot traffic. I thought it'd be bad, yeah, I thought it'd be bad, but it's a lot worse than I thought it was gonna be. So, I don't really know, I've lost loads of money, and it's just a nightmare for us working down there. On the other hand, Sarah Spratley, who works at a cafe, says she's pleased to have the G7 come to Cornwall. It is quite divided, it is, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Some people don't like the fact it's here, they don't like the fact that roads are closed, the fact that all these people are going to be here. Um, I just think it's quite exciting. Yeah. I think it's lovely to see. But she understood many locals were frustrated with road closures. Because it's not the easiest place to get into, if there's a lot of road closures, is it? No. Really? But yeah, it's, it is divided, the opinion's divided. 
Train stations, roads, and footpaths in the immediate vicinity of Carbis Bay Hotel and Tregenna Castle were closed. That's where the summit will be held. More than 5,000 police officers from across the country have been deployed to the area. The G7 will be the first in-person meeting of leaders from major developed economies in nearly two years. This year's agenda will focus on the pandemic and climate policy. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. TC Energy is abandoning the Keystone XL pipeline. This comes months after Biden suspended its construction permit. The company said it will make sure its exit is environmentally sound, and it's working with Alberta to recover the province's $1 billion investment. Here are the details. Canada-based energy firm TC Energy officially pulls out of the Keystone XL pipeline. It comes months after Biden halted construction operations through an executive order on his first day in office. Biden cleared the way for the completion of the Russian Nord Stream 2 pipeline by removing sanctions on its company and CEO after he canceled the Keystone pipeline. Keystone's TC Energy said it will coordinate with stakeholders, regulators and indigenous groups to make sure its exit from the project meets environmental commitments. Biden's decision can be seen as an extension of Obama-era policies. The State Department has decided that the Keystone XL pipeline would not serve the national interests of the United States. I agree with that decision. The pipeline would have moved over 800,000 barrels or 35 million gallons of crude oil every day, 1,200 miles from Canada through Nebraska to the Gulf Coast. Environmental groups cheered on the decision to halt it, but Biden faced significant blowback from Republicans and industry groups after reversing the Trump era move. Trump approved the permit for the pipeline shortly after he took office. I am pleased to announce the official approval of the presidential permit for the Keystone XL pipeline. TransCanada will finally be allowed to complete this long overdue project with efficiency and with speed. The premier of Alberta province in Canada said he was frustrated with the circumstances surrounding the project, and that includes Biden's revoking the permit for the pipeline's border crossing. Alberta officials reached an agreement with the company to exit their partnership. Both the company and province will try to recover the Alberta government's $1 billion investment, but they did not say how. Meatpacker JBS USA said Wednesday it paid the equivalent of $11 million ransom in a cyber attack that disrupted its North American and Australian operations. The meatpacking firm JBS USA paid a ransom equivalent to $11 million after it fell victim to a cyber attack. The company's U.S. CEO said on Wednesday they made the payment to protect their customers. Last week's cyber attack led to the suspension of cattle slaughtering at all of JBS's U.S. plants for a day. The company produces nearly a quarter of America's beef, and there were fears that the disruption would threaten food supply chains and further inflate food prices. The attack also disrupted JBS operations in Australia. Ransom software works by encrypting victims' data. Typically, hackers will offer the victim a key in return for cryptocurrency payments. The CEO of JBS USA, Andre Noguera, said this was a very difficult decision to make for our company and for me personally. However, we felt this decision had to be made to prevent any potential risk to our customers. The FBI said earlier this month it was investigating about 100 different types of ransomware. The cyber attack on JBS followed one last month on Colonial Pipeline, the largest pipeline in the U.S. That attack disrupted fuel delivery for several days in the U.S. Southeast. A Russia-linked hacker group has been blamed for both attacks. A bipartisan group of senators is negotiating on immigration reform. They're looking at three bills to be put into one large bill that could potentially gain enough support on both sides of the aisle to pass the House and Senate. This comes as the Department of Homeland Security just announced they reunited seven children with their families over the past month. But their report also shows a couple of thousand children do not have confirmed records of uni uni reunification. NTD's Melina Weiskopf has more on that. The administration's new task force identified nearly 4,000 children who were separated from their families since 2017, as former President Trump was implementing a new zero-tolerance policy to deter migrants from illegally entering the U.S. About half of those 4,000 children were already reunited under past court orders. 
Since the Biden administration launched the new task force, seven families have been reunited. But there are 2,127 children who do not have a confirmed record of reunification, according to the DHS's latest report. But the administration didn't offer any more details about why there are no records for these thousands of children awaiting reunification. And policy on immigration reform is still a huge topic of discussion here on Capitol Hill. Today, a group of bipartisan senators was set to meet to continue their negotiation talks on immigration reform. This bipartisan group is looking at three bills. They want to push these all into one bill that can gain enough Republican support to actually pass in the Senate. So in an evenly divided Senate, these negotiation talks are key in order to get some form of immigration reform bill onto Biden's desk. The bipartisan group is led by Democrat Senator Dick Durbin. The first two bills they're looking at aim to grant citizenship to dreamers and migrant farm workers. These two bills already passed the House, but need to be negotiated for them to win some Republican votes in the Senate. The third bill they're looking at was introduced by Democrat Senator Kirsten Sinema and Republican Senator John Cornyn. Their proposal aims to deal with the surge at the border right now by creating more processing centers at the southern border. And it would also require the DHS to inform border cities before releasing immigrants into their communities. This bipartisan group will need to continue negotiation talks to find common ground between Republicans and Democrats to see how they can come together to quell the chaos at the border and possibly change U.S. immigration laws. Melina Weisskup, NTD News. And the Customs and Border Protection Agency just released a report. They found that in May, more than 180,000 people tried to illegally enter the U.S. from the southern border. They say single adult males make up the majority of these illegal entry attempts. Talks on gun background checks have stopped between a Republican and a Democrat senator. The senators say they're not at odds, but just couldn't find a way to move forward. Republican Senator John Cornyn says he and Democrat Senator Chris Murphy were working on a potential deal before talks were cut off. Murphy confirmed the same in a statement. Murphy says they couldn't find a way to increase the number of gun sales that require background checks in a way that makes sense to him. Murphy says that he is speaking with Republican senators about other gun control proposals. Cornyn told The Hill that both his and Murphy's staff worked hard but were not able to reach a conclusion. Ohio is taking on Google. In a new lawsuit, the state's attorney general argues the government should regulate the company more. NTD's Christina Kim tells us more about the legal battle. According to Ohio's Attorney General Dave Yost, Google uses its dominance of Internet search to steer Ohioans to Google's own products. That's discriminatory and anti-competitive. The complaint also points out that instead of charging a fee, Google collects and monetizes user data in various ways. Yost wants the courts to declare Google a public utility and to regulate it as one. This could look like stopping the company from prioritizing its own products, services, and websites. We're just trying to get them and the courts to recognize because they've gotten so big, because they're so ingrown to every aspect of our modern lives, that they have a higher duty to the public interest. A Google spokesperson told the Epic Times the lawsuit would make Google search results worse and make it harder for small businesses to connect directly with customers. They say people simply don't want the government to run Google like a gas or electric company. But Yost doesn't want to change their algorithm. He just doesn't want Google's thumb on the scale anymore. There will be a much more level playing field uh, when you uh, do that Google search. Um, you won't be getting preferred results for businesses that Google's invested in. You'll actually be getting the raw results of their algorithm. This comes as Google and other tech giants are facing a growing number of antitrust lawsuits and challenges. Christina Kim, NTD News. A hospital system in Texas has suspended workers who didn't get the CCP virus vaccine. Most workers complied, but some are choosing not to get vaccinated. The Houston Methodist Hospital System informed employees that they need to get a vaccine or submit documentation for an exemption. Exemptions are based only on a medical condition or religious beliefs. CEO Mark Broom told employees in an internal memo obtained by the Epoch Times that 178 workers either didn't get fully vaccinated or didn't get vaccinated at all. As a result, he suspended them without pay for 14 days 
and if the employees still don't comply by the end of the suspension period, they will be fired. The system has received strong pushback for this mandate. Over 100 employees joined together to file a lawsuit. They note the three vaccines have emergency approval but have not been fully approved by drug regulators. First, it was free beer for getting the COVID-19 vaccine. Now it's joints for jabs because nothing says health quite like recreational drugs and alcohol. NTD's Grace Coulter has more on Washington State's latest vaccine incentives. President Biden's goal was to have 70 percent of Americans at least partially vaccinated by July 4th. But vaccine rates are falling across the country. So states are coming up with all sorts of creative ways to incentivize vaccination. Joints for jabs is the latest. That's Washington State's Liquor and Cannabis Board slogan for the incentive program. The board announced it will start allowing state licensed cannabis retailers to provide one joint to adult consumers who receive COVID-19 vaccination at an in-store vaccination clinic. The offer is available until July 12th for people over 21 and older. This isn't the first time the state has permitted recreational drugs as a vaccine incentive. Last month, the board allowed places like bars, breweries and restaurants to give out free beer, wine and cocktails to people who could prove they've gotten their shot. Incentives in other states range from free burgers and fries in New York. If this is appealing to you, just think of this when you think of vaccination. Mmm. Vaccination. Rifle and shotgun lotteries in West Virginia, million dollar lotteries in Ohio, and even five million dollar lotteries in California. College scholarships, amusement park, and concert tickets are also up for grabs. But are the incentives working? Some early vaccination numbers suggest the hefty lottery in Ohio is. But the jury is still out on the effectiveness of the other prizes and freebies. However, a number of people have questioned the ethics of the incentives and ask why people need to get a carrot to get the jab. Grace Coulter, NTD News. A man in Las Vegas has been accused of stealing blank COVID-19 vaccine cards the Los Angeles County District Attorney says the incident happened in April at a vaccination center at the Pomona Fairplex. Mohamed Raouf Ahmed is now charged with one felony count of grand theft. Authorities say the 45-year-old stole more than 500 blank cards from the vaccination site where he was contracted to work. Prosecutors say each card has a value of at least $15 if illegally sold. Still to come, a Virginia teacher who was suspended for speaking out against using transgender pronouns has been reinstated by a court order. But a number of parents and teachers say this isn't enough. El Salvador is now accepting Bitcoin as official legal tender. Will this trend catch on in other countries? We give you some of the different perspectives on the issue of cryptocurrency. All that and more on NTD News. A notorious Mexican drug lord's wife is now facing charges herself. Emma Coronel, the wife of Joaquin El Chapo Guzman, plans to plead guilty to drug trafficking charges in federal court in Washington Thursday. The information was first reported by the New York Times. Last week, Coronel's attorney told Univision that she would seek to reach a plea deal with U.S. prosecutors, but added the pact would not include cooperation with authorities. Coronel was arrested in February at Washington Dulles International Airport. Since then, she's been at a Virginia prison on charges of involvement in international drug trafficking. That's according to the United States Department of Justice. You may remember the Virginia teacher who was put on leave after saying he would not refer to students by their preferred pronouns because it goes against his religion. Well, he sued the school board, and today a judge ruled in his favor. Here are the details. After much support and prayer, elementary school teacher Tana Cross is heading back to the classroom, at least for now. He won an initial legal battle on Tuesday against Loudoun County Public Schools. Cross was put on leave after expressing his views at a public school board meeting. He spoke against a proposal that would require teachers to use students' preferred pronouns instead of their biological sex. I love all of my students, but I will never lie to them regardless of the consequences. 
I'm a teacher, but I serve God first, and I will not affirm that a biological boy can be a girl and vice versa because it's against my religion, it's lying to a child, it's abuse to a child, and it's sinning against our God. The judge ruled in Cross's favor, saying evidence suggests the school district violated Cross's First Amendment rights to speech and religious liberty. Alliance Defending Freedom, the nonprofit advocacy group representing Cross, called the win a massive victory for freedom of speech. But a number of parents and teachers in Loudoun County aren't satisfied. At a school board meeting Tuesday night, they urged the board to respect First Amendment rights. When I saw a teacher express an opinion and suspended for expressing his religious beliefs, I could no longer stay silent. When did it become acceptable to be tolerant only when someone expresses a view that we agree with? When did it become appropriate to silence those that hold Christian biblical views just because you don't? You send a message to parents and teachers that if we dare voice dissenting views, you will retaliate. That's what tyrants do, not public servants in a free country. Now that he's been reinstated by a judge, we must ensure this never happens again. For the members of Chardonnay and Tifa, here is your assignment with a copy of the First Amendment attached. I'm going to lead this here and I hope you learn something. The court order will only allow Cross to maintain his job until December 31st, unless other orders are put in place. But the judge suggested Cross is likely to succeed if his case is brought to trial. Grace Coulter, NTD News. If you're in El Salvador, you can now use Bitcoin to purchase goods, making it the first country to do so. Many are reacting to this news, with some saying this is good news for the digital currency market, while others are more skeptical. NTD's Christina Kim brings us the different viewpoints. El Salvador uses the U.S. dollar as its official currency, and now it's the first country to also accept Bitcoin as legal tender. People don't have to use Bitcoin if they don't want, but if it's offered as a form of payment, they must accept it. Additionally, prices can be expressed in Bitcoin, taxes can also be paid in Bitcoin, and exchanges in Bitcoin won't be subject to capital gains tax. But the U.S. dollar will remain the reference currency. Economic analyst Joseph Trevisani says the thing that impacts Bitcoin's value is how widely accepted it is. And there's no doubt that this move from El Salvador is helping the crypto market, at least for now. Shortly after the vote, the price of Bitcoin rose 5%. This is a positive for them. This will be looked upon by all traders and all participants in the market as a, a future positive item. Public perception is especially important because Bitcoin has no grounding in any of the economically traded markets. It's a purely electronic entity. That adds to its volatility. For example, when Colonial Pipeline ransom money was recovered, the value of Bitcoin fell. When Elon Musk expressed concerns over Bitcoin, it also fell. That's why Professor Steve Hankey, one of the world's leading experts on currencies, is skeptical about the move. He also says there could be more nefarious reasons that El Salvador moved to accept this hard-to-trace currency. This idea of Bitcoin becoming legal tender is, is a very bizarre kind of move. If, if, you, if you already have a great currency, why, why Bitcoin? Because Bitcoin is not a currency. It's a highly speculative asset. It's, its price is very volatile. As for the argument that Bitcoin could one day replace gold, Hankey says it's nonsense. But like it or not, Trevisani believes cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin will remain as an alternative. Some people think the world is going to end, and so Bitcoin is a good thing to hold. Other people distrust governments as a matter of course, so Bitcoin is a good thing to have. Other people have criminal activities, it's harder to trace. Others just like the trading volatility. All of the reasons are valid reasons, meaning that they give people a reason to participate. El Salvador's move may not have a large global impact. Both Hanke and Travisani believe the strength of the U.S. dollar as the international currency will hold. As for the long-term impact of El Salvador's move, Hanke thinks it could be negative. In a financial sense, I think, I think it could be, ironically, bad news for Bitcoin because I, th I think this will invite much more harsh and serious regulation of of Bitcoin and, and cryptocurrencies. It might take a few years for Bitcoin's value to stabilize, if it does stabilize. And with more countries looking into digital currencies, we'll have to see how things play out. Christina Kim, 
NTD News. Up next, a coalition of mayors are supporting the largest proposed budget for homelessness aid in California's history. It features a multi-billion dollar plan. A flea market that started in 1960 on the West Coast is at risk of shrinking down for urban development. It has its roots in Silicon Valley and vendors call it their home. Stay tuned to find out more. Hello, I'm Mike Lindell, inventor of MyPillow. Thanks to your support, you've helped make MyPillow become one of the fastest growing companies in America. Over the last 12 years, you've helped MyPillow create thousands of jobs right here in the USA. When I got MyPillow, I'm asleep almost immediately. I stay asleep at night and I wake up more well-rested in the morning. That's why I invented my pillow. My patented fill adjusts to your exact individual needs and helps keep your neck supported and aligned. I'm interrupting this commercial right now. Retailers have canceled my pillow. And to thank you for your support, I'm going to pass the savings directly on to you. For example, you get my six piece towel sets, regular $109.99, now only $44.98. Or my pillow dog beds for as low as $19.99 with your promo code. For the best night's sleep in the whole wide world, visit mypillow.com. Hi folks, Joe Namath here, and if you're on Medicare, this is important. You're now entitled to eliminate co-pays and get dental care, dentures, eyeglasses, prescription coverage, in-home aids, unlimited transportation, and home-delivered meals, all at no additional cost. Plus, your zip code may have coverage with the Give Back benefit that adds money back to your Social Security check every month. I call to get dental, transportation, meals, and the gift back benefit. With this virus situation, I call to get everything I'm entitled to. I couldn't believe I was missing out on so many benefits. With the uncertainty of the virus, you need to get everything you're entitled to. Millions of people have trusted the Medicare coverage helpline. You can too. Call now. It's free. Call 1-800-764-1930. That's 1-800-764-1930 now. California mayors are supporting the largest homelessness funding in the state's history. Here's NTD's Eileen Ng with more details. A coalition of mayors from California's 13 largest cities are supporting state funding for homelessness. The state legislature's budget has proposed $1 billion per year for the homeless over the next four years. California's historic budget surplus presents the legislature and the governor with a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to make critical investments to bring our residents off the street. According to one report, California accounted for more than half of all unsheltered people in the country. The historic investment to local cities and counties will directly help fund homeless programs for mental health care, case managers, and other resources. To be able to have a foundation that builds on the way that cities can act quickly, can act deeply and accountably. If you want to see something happen against the, in the fight against homelessness, make sure local leaders have frictionless, fast money they can put in a flexible way out there. Frictionless, fast, and flexible. Permanent housing and recovery is the absolute goal. But there are significant steps for many people before they can succeed in permanent housing, and that is to get them off the streets into either congregate shelter or tiny homes or even safe ground environment. The big city mayors say there will be accountability measures in place to ensure that taxpayer money will be used to address homelessness. In May, Governor Gavin Newsom announced a $12 billion investment for the homeless crisis. It is the largest in California's history. It aims to create over 46,000 new housing units, help hundreds of thousands of homeless Californians, clean streets, and end family homelessness within the next five years. Eileen Ang, NTD News, California. Governor Gavin Newsom and state lawmakers in California are getting a pay raise. It comes amid a campaign to recall Newsom from the governor's seat. The Los Angeles Times says a commission voted unanimously to approve a 4.2 percent raise for Newsom and state lawmakers. The hikes will take effect in December. Pay for 132 state lawmakers will rise to $119,700 per year. 
Newsom's pay will reach $218,500 per year. The Attorney General, Lieutenant Governor, Treasurer, and members of the Board of Equalization will also see pay increases. State officials can voluntarily request a pay cut, and Newsom and several others did so last year. The Commission also cannot issue raises during budget deficits. The state's budget is now in surplus. In Southern California, officials announced the largest drug bust in its history. The suspects had a large illegal marijuana growing operation. Here's NTD's Eileen Ng with more. On Tuesday, the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department announced they cracked down on the largest drug operation in the department's history. They raided greenhouses in Lancaster, California, filled with millions of dollars worth of marijuana. The operation was discovered after authorities received multiple complaints over several months from local residents. We were getting complaints about how these illegal marijuana grows was impacting life here. People were being threatened. Uh, water was being stolen from farmers to the point where there's farms that are going out of business because they no longer afford the water. That's how much the marijuana operation is impacting the high desert. So far, they made 23 arrests, seized five firearms, and recovered two water trucks. Five men identified as Mexican nationals were detained at the scene. They arrived in the U.S. within the last month. We have alfalfa farmers, potato and carrot farmers, and semen then go out of business to support an illegal marijuana, and which enriches the cartels, is something we're not going to tolerate at all. According to a spokesperson for the United States Drug Enforcement Administration, growing illegal marijuana leaves toxins, harming the natural environment. It also diverts water away from farmers. Last year, L.A. County found 150 illegal marijuana growers, but this year, the number increased to over 500. The number of greenhouses involved also grew from an average of 8 to 15. Eileen Ng, NTD News, California. Authorities in California are looking for a hit-and-run driver. That's after a collision killed three girls and injured a fourth. California Highway Patrol says the girls were struck while walking along the side of a rural San Bernardino road Saturday night. 12-year-old Daytona Branas, 13-year-old Sandra Miser, and 11-year-old Willow Sanchez were killed. 14-year-old Natalie Coe, who you can see in the upper left-hand side of the screen, is in con- critical condition at the hospital. Branas and Coe are wheelchair-bound. Highway Patrol believes the driver of a white Chevrolet, Silver- Chevrolet Silverado hit them from behind. The suspect then fled the scene on foot. A makeshift memorial for the girls was set up at the scene of the accident. One of the largest flea markets in Northern California may be shrinking down. A staple of Silicon Valley life may soon be replaced by urban development. NTD's David Lamb has the story. This is the Berryessa Flea Market, which is home to over 400 family-owned stands. But most of this could be at risk of closing down or relocating after the city's proposal to redevelop the land. Colorful piñatas, cultural souvenirs, and a farmer's market are a few of the myriad of treats found here. The 60-year-old flea market is located next to a rail station. Developers see it as prime land to turn into an urban village. It, ooh, the flea market means a lot to me. I think that it's definitely my second home. You know, at first, I'm not going to lie, it's always, it was uh, when I was growing up, it's a little bit embarrassing to be working at the flea market. Kayla Escobedo is a key member of the market's Vendors Association. She says if the proposal is approved, vendors will be offered $2 million to help with moving and storage expenses. And they said, hey, honestly, I don't want money. Like, we don't want money. We want to work. Like, we want to have the opportunity to to keep working. Like, that's what I want. You could give me whatever money, but it's only going to be a certain time, and then I won't have that money. And so then what happens then, right? The city plans to reduce 30 acres of flea market space down to five. This does not include the parking area. Only a quarter of the current vendors could continue working there. Well, me and my family, like my cousin and my mom and dad, we all grew up on it, so... Well, people wouldn't really like it if it was close, so... Community members and vendors marched during a protest, donning signs that read, Save the Flea Market. ...are from this community, and so to move it away, it's just further marginalizing and displacing an entire cultures, multiple cultures and multiple peoples and neighborhoods. Escobedo is worried that the longtime vendors may struggle to find other jobs, particularly the ones that don't speak English fluently. San Jose claims to be a, a place, um, a city that really cares about small businesses. Well, I feel like this is their chance to show that. 
but many of them are San Jose residents. Escobedo says the city had wanted to develop over the market since 2007 and began updating the plans due to the addition of the rail station. A meeting is scheduled for later this month. If a development agreement is reached, vendors will get a one-year notice before closure. David Lamb, NTD News, California. Coming up, concerns keep growing about China stealing American technology and intellectual property. Now a U.S. university professor is facing trial for concealing his ties with China while receiving U.S. government research funds. And is the U.S. too dependent on China for critical supplies? The Pentagon's new report highlights one supply chain that China currently dominates. That and more on NTD News. A scientist from the University of Tennessee is facing charges for hiding research work in China while receiving U.S. government grants for his work in Tennessee. The case was brought to court on Monday, and he is the first to be put on trial among many researchers arrested over similar accusations. An Ming Hu is a former assistant professor at University of Tennessee. He is facing felony charges including wire fraud and making false statements related to his work in China. The case stems from Hu's dual professorship with UT and the Beijing University of Technology in China. The prosecutor alleges that he hid his China collaborations from the U.S. government while receiving grants from NASA for his research at UT. Hu was born in China and is a naturalized citizen of Canada. He is the first professor at an American university to be criminally charged as a result of a 2011 law that keeps federal agencies from unwittingly funding the CCP's ambitions in scientific research. Who denies the charges? The U.S. Senate passed a $250 billion bill on Tuesday trying to boost competition with China in technology research. It also puts more restrictions on recipients of U.S. government research funds from accepting money from governments like China or Russia. The Pentagon's new report says that the U.S. is exclusively dependent on Chinese imports, especially rare earth minerals. They suggest diversifying supply chains. NTD's Tiffany Meyer brings us more on the story. A new government report is out, in line with Biden's 100-day supply chain review order, and includes findings from the Defense Department, among other agencies. The review assesses risk to America's access to critical products, like those used in pharmaceuticals and semiconductors. It finds the U.S. excessively dependent on imports from China, especially rare earth minerals used in electronics and the aerospace industry. Rare earth minerals are also used in enhancing metal properties, something critical for manufacturing and agriculture. China currently dominates the world's rare earth supply chain. This directly affects the flow of key materials around the world. As a result, many rare earth producers in the U.S. are shutting down because they can no longer compete with China. Some of them even moved their business there. The report also warns of China's unfair trade practices, like restricting exports to gain trade leverage over the U.S. Beijing's aggressive tactics could potentially expose the U.S. to supply chain vulnerabilities, a hidden hazard to national and economic security. The report points out that China has shown a willingness to restrict access to resources, with reductions in its exports of rare earth elements over the past 10 years. In addition, the report finds that China took over large portions of supply chains and several critical materials using state-led non-market interventions. And even if the U.S. was to diversify its import sources, it would still be reliant on China for processing before use in end product manufacturing. The report advises the U.S. to work with allies and partners to diversify supply chains away from China. On Tuesday, the White House also called on Congress to authorize at least $50 billion in investment funding for domestic manufacturing and research on key materials. Just ahead, France reopens its indoor dining spaces to customers. An iconic restaurant is gearing up to welcome eager clients and serve up spectacular dishes. Catch a glimpse of what's happening in the kitchen there and more here on NTD News. When the game's over and it's time to go home, sometimes your car has other plans. That's why I drive with CarShield. As expensive as car repairs can be, I wanted the best defense around. 
And with CarShield's administrators, they make sure that you don't get stuck with expensive car repairs like this. Did I forget to mention that with CarShield's network, I also get 24-7 roadside assistance, towing, and rental car reimbursement included. That's peace of mind every driver needs. I saved close to $9,000. If it wasn't for Car Shields, I wouldn't have my car. I got to tell you, it's quite a relief not to worry about expensive car breakdowns anymore. And with Car Shields administrators, you can choose your favorite mechanic or dealer to do the work. Plus, it's easier than ever to get America's favorite car protection. There's no long-term contracts, and coverage is affordable for every wallet size. If I didn't have Car Shield, I would have been out of pocket $7,000. As a parent of three, I couldn't have that. I trust Car Shield administrators because they paid my claim. Talk about MVP protection for less than the cost of a ball game. Take it from me, the boomer. Nobody wants to go through the headache of an expensive car breakdown on their own. If you're driving without a warranty, you have to call Car Shield. Yeah, you do. So do yourself and your car a favor. Call Car Shield. They're your best line of defense against expensive breakdowns. Car Shield administrators paid almost $4,000 for my repairs. Car Shield is wonderful. They saved me $1,300. With Car Shield, I saved $4,100 on my first repair. Over a million happy drivers couldn't be wrong. Call Car Shield now. Protect yourself now against expensive auto repair bills. Call Car Shield for a free and instant protection plan quote. Once your car breaks down, it's too late. Call 1 800 862 2990. That's 1 800 862 2990. 1 800 862 2990. Eateries in France can once again serve guests indoors. The country is known as one of the world's greatest culinary capitals and is working to recover from months of pandemic-induced closures. NTD's Andrew Thomas brings us more. After nearly eight months of closure, familiar aromas and lots of noise return to the kitchens of Le Tremblou restaurant in Paris. The French government has given restaurants the green light to reopen their indoor dining rooms as of Wednesday, June 9th. It's great to see the team again because for most of them, it's been since last October, nearly a year, a year since we last saw each other. We need to get back into a routine and put back a bit of drive here because it's such a great house that performs well and we'll have a better idea tomorrow in hopes that clients will be present. Restaurants were ordered to close at the end of October last year when France was facing a second wave of the pandemic. Cafes and restaurants resumed serving customers on their terraces in May, but indoor seating wasn't permitted. Ahead of the opening, head chef Samir Balia visited the different kitchen sections to make sure everyone was ready to serve patrons again. Tomorrow we'll be eating loads of interesting things. We have a summer menu. For example, we have a starter with octopus, sauces with spices from the east. The historic Le Tremblou opened in 1900 and serves fine food and wines. In the dining room, manager Cyril Gibbon was also keen to welcome the first guests. He says the wait has been difficult for him. We're excited, excited to see our clients again, excited to find life again in the dining room and the kitchens, to hear clients chat away, to give the right instructions to the waiters, and just to do our job. This is true joy. Restaurants can open only half of their indoor seating areas until the end of June. After that, full capacity will be restored. From Wednesday, diners will also be allowed to stay out later, with the local curfew now pushed back from 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. Switzerland may ban artificial pesticides soon. Swiss voters will decide on it through a referendum this Sunday. An opinion poll shows an almost 50-50 split between supporters and opponents. Switzerland could become the first European country to ban artificial pesticides. That is, if Swiss voters approve a relevant initiative through a referendum on June 13th. It is a boon to those concerned about health issues and biodiversity loss. Organic farmers, for example, are among the supporters. That would be incredibly great for people's quality of life. Our drinking water will, sometime in the future, 20 or 30 years from now, be pure again. Our soil would be fertile again and we would have less dependence on foreign countries because our farmers produce bio-friendly, which means they need less additives. 
Supporters of the initiative aim to outlaw products by agrochemical giants, such as Switzerland's Syngenta and Germany's Bayer and BASF. But manufacturers defend the safety of their products. They say that pesticides enhance the quality and quantity of yields. Another initiative on the ballot is about clean water. It proposes to end direct subsidies to farmers who use synthetic pesticides and antibiotics. It would also ban animal feed imports and limit the number of livestock because their manure can pollute drinking water. Farmers opposing the initiative find their way of life under siege. Our production would go rapidly down. We won't have any Swiss chicken uh, meat. We won't have any Swiss uh, pig meat. And the result would be there would be much more import. But those in favor of the ban believe organic farming is possible without impacting the prices. A Geneva resident at an outdoor market says she will vote yes. We cannot continue to use pesticide for farming. It damages people's health, it damages the soils, and if we think of the next 20, 30 years, I think we really need to think about the safety, the health of the population, and the quality of the soils. A recent poll shows 48 percent of voters support the Clean Water Initiative, and 49 percent support the pesticide ban. If adopted, the proposals will give farmers up to 10 years to make the transition. As summer arrives in the U.S., two alpacas in Australia's New South Wales have been spotted enjoying a winter chill. Social media video show the pair prancing through a recent snowfall on Thursday. One of them munched on a lemon tree, shaking snow off the branches. A cold front has brought wild winter weather across eastern Australia, with snow falling across New South Wales and flash flooding in Victoria. Overnight, temperatures had fallen as much as 45 degrees Fahrenheit below average in parts of New South Wales and Queensland. That's according to a tweet from the Bureau of Meteorology. Next up, a 69-year-old marathon runner hopes the controversial new Alzheimer's drug can keep him active for many more marathons, but a doctor warns about the hype. Believers and non-believers alike are making their way to a holy site in Spain for relief from the pandemic. Survey results say it's better than a vacation. Learn more in just a minute. Locals and officials organizing the Olympic marathon in Japan say they're worried how their city will cope under the weight of growing COVID cases and safety measures they say are slow to materialize in the lead up to the games. Olympic marathon events were initially moved from Tokyo to the cooler northern city of Sapporo to avoid the intense summer heat in the Japanese capital. But two years on, critics say Tokyo 2020 organizers have effectively leapt from the frying pan into the fire. Hokkaido, the northernmost island where Sapporo is the main city, has the second highest per capita COVID-19 rate in Japan, even higher than Tokyo. Opposition from residents is growing, and officials in the city, like Takashi Okugi, who is in charge of Olympic preparations, say they still don't have key information, including the number of athletes to expect and details on health facilities. For example, if an athlete gets infected, how can we support them when they need to go to a quarantine facility or a hospital? Or how can we communicate and cooperate with Tokyo 2020? We still need to meticulously discuss these things. The Tokyo 2020 organizing committee did not immediately comment. Sapporo hosted a half marathon as a test event in May. All participants, including six international athletes, had to log their temperature and answer a health questionnaire daily in the week leading up to the event. Organizers hailed it a success. But this week, more than a dozen civic groups in Hokkaido Prefecture submitted a petition to demand the governor cancel all events scheduled to take place in the city. 69-year-old runner and Alzheimer's patient Bill McKay hopes the new Biodrun, Biogen drug will get his life back on track, but his doctor cautions patients not to look to Adjahelm as the holy grail. For 69-year-old Bill McKay, the FDA's approval this week of Biogen's controversial Alzheimer's drug offers hope that the veteran of 29 marathons can keep on running. Let's work on just being healthy 
and trying to extend my life as far as it will go and do what I can. His wife, Jill, is hopeful the treatment will prevent her husband, who was in the early stages of the disease, from getting lost along the way. That's a big worry for me. I work full time, and so I'm not home during the day. And if, you know, he goes out for a run. I wonder, you know, am I, I'm going to get that phone call, you know, Bill should have been back 45 minutes ago and we don't know where he went. Bill McKay already qualifies for Biogen's drug oh, called right. Aduhelm, right. the first new treatment for Alzheimer's in nearly two decades and the first to target a cause of Alzheimer's by removing amyloid plaques from the brain. But the drug's approval comes with major asterisks. In two large clinical trials, Aduhelm showed a benefit in one, but not in the other. And a panel of outside experts said the data failed to prove that the medicine works. And some trial patients experienced potentially dangerous brain swelling. It's why his doctor, Michigan neurologist Kara Leahy, is adamant about cautioning patients not to look to Aduhelm as the holy grail. So there is going to be a lot of important education that we discuss with patients with um, a realistic idea of what this medication is and what it is not. So to make sure that patients understand this is not a cure, um, that we are hoping that it has some ability to slow down the progression for patients, but that the learning about this medication is ongoing. The FDA has required a post-approval trial to demonstrate that Aduhelm does in fact slow cognitive and functional decline, but that could take years. Its price tag, roughly $56,000 per year, although it's not yet clear how much the drug will cost patients like Bill McKay, most of whom will be covered by Medicare. Despite questions about the drug's effectiveness and cost, the McKays have gone ahead and scheduled an appointment with Dr. Leahy for next week. More than 900 medical centers will start intravenous infusions of the drug in as soon as two weeks. Spain's St. James Way is an ancient pilgrimage trail originating in medieval times. After a year of closure due to the pandemic, it's once again offering pilgrims the chance to heal from the past year's effects and embrace their faith. Backpacks filled, hiking poles in hands, in groups or with a partner, pilgrims in Spain are making their way to the Camino de Santiago, or the Way of St. James. Many have come looking for solace and spiritual growth to combat the effects of the pandemic. You unburden yourself, let go of what is negative inside you, start thinking and you give things a little more value. The fact is that the pandemic has taught us to give more value to important things. St. James Way is a vast network of paths leading to Santiago's Baroque Cathedral. It drew more than 340,000 walkers from all over the world in 2019. But that number dropped to only 50,000 last year due to Spain's lockdown measures. In recent weeks, pilgrims have started trickling back in after authorities lifted travel restrictions. For those forced away from their families during the pandemic, walking together for days, weeks or months provides an opportunity to reunite. We really wanted to do something all together as a family. The whole family is healthy and we wanted to thank the saint a little bit for the luck we have had. According to the country's health ministry, close to 80,000 people died from the virus in Spain. Santiago's archbishop expects some 300,000 pilgrims to visit this year. For sure, many people will have lost many loved ones, I'm sure. And indeed, they will come with tears in their eyes. But I think they will come taking firm steps because they really believe in Christ, who said that I am life. St. James Way attracts both Roman Catholics and non-believers. Based on a survey by Barcelona's Autonomous University, walking the pilgrimage reduces stress, anxiety and depression better than a normal vacation. The way takes you away. It takes away the chaff from the grain. The way makes you stay with the essentials of life. So, when you live from the essence, even though there are moments of great suffering, you can also see the fullness in each moment of existence. To encourage pilgrims, Pope Francis prolonged the Jubilee year for St. James, set in 2020, to continue through 2021. Roman Catholics believe pilgrimage during a jubilee year leads to a full remission of sins. And that's all for now. Catch us again tonight at 6.30 Eastern. In New York City, I'm Kevin Hogan.
We have a new channel. Subscribe to us on YouTube at NTD News. Get the highlights of our news broadcast and the most important headlines that we curate especially for you. Don't let YouTube decide what information you get. That's your choice. YouTube is deleting our videos and cuts you off from a source of honest reporting. Make sure you don't lose access to NTD's news content and take a quick moment to subscribe to our newsletter so no matter what happens here, you'll keep your access to a trustworthy news source.